Okay. So, as Californians, we have something that a lot of other states, as a matter of fact, a lot of other countries for that matter, we have something that they don't. We have beaches, a natural beauty that most people only get to go to a handful of times in their life. As a matter of fact, a lot of people flock here because of our great beaches at Newport and um, all of the other ones. So what if suddenly tomorrow, those beaches became filled with plastic and other trash? What if the next time you went in the water, you got some sort of rash or a poisoning? Unfortunately, that may become a reality a lot sooner than you think. According to environmentalist Mark Carls, approximately 1.4 billion pounds of trash enter the ocean each year. Because of our, neg our neglect on waste management techniques, our ocean is beginning to suffer gravely and eventually it's going to catch up to us. Um, yeah. So, I believe, I think what we should all do as a community is improve our waste management techniques and by reducing ocean pollution so we save our ocean and in turn save ourselves. To really understand why ocean pollution is such a big problem, we first have to understand where it comes from, where, where it's the source. Unsurprisingly, it's right here on land. We um, create the waste in what's primarily known as non-point source pollution, which makes up 80% of the marine environment pollution, according to oceanservice.gov. And the way that works is um, any trash lying around anywhere can make it into the ocean via storm drains on the side of roads. I don't know if you've ever seen them when it rains that's where the water goes. The water goes down those drains and goes directly into the ocean. So if there's trash up on the sidewalks and roads, the, ra the rainwater will push that trash into those drains, effectively leading into the ocean. Uh, all streams and rivers, of course, also uh, lead to the ocean, and those are typically very uh, filled with trash and other waste, which again, lead to the ocean. That's mainly how they get there. Acid rain is another type of um, pollutant that makes its way. It's actually typical, uh, technically an air pollutant, but when it comes down as acid rain, it also finds its way to the ocean, chemically polluting our seas. Um, now once all that debris and chemical makes it into our oceans, it becomes known as marine debris. And that can, uh, it's basically any trash that's in our water. Uh, Debrisfree.org states that it's estimated that plastic makes up around 60 to 80 percent of that debris. So most of the trash is our plastic products that we're done using that make it in there. Um, that can, uh, over time, those, because you know, plastic, glass, styrofoam, all those trashes, they float in the water, you don't see. They're easily movable by the ocean currents, and they can move miles and miles from where, when they initially got into the ocean. And over time, those currents can form, like when they converge, they begin to form huge piles of this trash all over the ocean. One of the most known, or I guess infamously known, examples of these giant trash heaps is known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which lies between U U.S. and Japan and parts of Hawaii. It's essentially two giant pieces, floating pieces of trash in the ocean, uh, which spans, the last time it was measured, spans about 7.7 .7 million square inches. That's twice the size of Texas. Just a giant floating piece of trash in the ocean. Um, and in between, because you know it's made up of two distinct parts, and in between those giant piles of trash, lies the Midwest Island. And by being in between those huge piles, there's tons and tons of trash which wash up on those shores. It's like a plastic beach. It's, there's so much garbage there um, that make it onto there. So the trash goes from here, from our land, makes its way to the ocean, eventually become these huge clusters of, of pure garbage and waste. And that isn't, and as you probably know, that doesn't bode too well with marine life. They don't typically enjoy that. It impacts them, which also indirectly impacts us as a, as a society. Um, these marine life and marine animals often mistake 
this plastic or the waste as um, food. They think it's food, something they can eat. So as a result, they can end up choking on it or uh, suffocating. Sea turtles often mistake plastic bags floating in the water as jellyfish, and they eat them and effectively suffocate. I'm sure you've all probably seen photos of like a duck or a penguin with the, the six pack of coke, those little rings, around their neck. They get caught in them, and it's a form of entanglement, and they also suffocate and eventually die. I previously mentioned the Midway Islands that are located in the center of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Well, that island is home to one of the biggest uh, albatross populations. Albatross is like a type of bird, like a seabird. They nest in those islands, and because they live there, they're constantly surrounded by all that trash, and they also mistake you know, plastic, bottle, uh, plastic bottle caps as food. And not only do they eat it, but they also feed it to their young, who of course eat it, and they die from malnutrition and um, plastic poison. It's actually pretty unfortunate. I saw a video about the, a documentary about um, Midway Island and the albatrosses. It, there is so many of them that are just dead on the coastline. And one of the researchers actually opened up one of these dead albatrosses' stomachs, and all that was in it was just plastic bottles and little pieces of glass that just stay there. That's all that's in them. And what's unfortunate is that these birds are already decaying. Their bones are just there, but all the little pieces of plastic, they're not even escaped, and they're still there. Plastic can take hundreds of years to decompose. It can be there longer than we'll be here. And so it takes forever to break down. But when it finally does break down, that's when things actually get worse. When, when these plastics and other wastes finally break down into smaller pieces, they're known as microplastics, which, according to debriefree.org, are able to absorb, concentrate, and deliver toxic compounds to organisms that ingest them. They're almost like, those little particles are almost like sponges for waste. They can absorb gamma, or like different types of radiation from, uh, from the sun, and they can also absorb uh, waste like from oil spills and other chemicals. I don't know if anyone's ever told you to never microwave anything with styrofoam, like to never microwave a styrofoam plate or a cup. That's because styrofoam contains those uh, microplastics which absorb some of the radiation from microwaves, and it'll stay in your food, and if you eat it, you'll, you'll get sick. And of course, when those tiny little particles, fish will eat them, and then the fish might get you know, caught by fishermen, and we eat them, and we in turn would become ill from that. Yeah. And that, you know, in addition to, effect, to affecting the environment, it can affect us too by getting us sick. So, this probably sounds pretty bad. It seems like we might be doomed. We're going to eventually be buried in plastic. Thankfully, there are already a lot of alternatives. There are a lot of programs, a lot of methods you can do to help get rid of this. It's actually a lot simpler than you think. Uh, simply recycling or um, picking up any litter you find can make a huge difference. Uh, a program called Take Three is its sole goal is to just uh, encourage people one day at a beach to take three pieces of trash off the beach that you see. Uh, because if you don't pick them up, they'll obviously wash into the ocean and problems start again. Um, Oceana.org is a program solely dedicated to cleaning up Midway Island between the Great Pacific Garbage Patch to get rid of all that waste and pollutants in our ocean, along with some like netting techniques to pick it up. Ultimately, pollution is there's, ocean pollution is our own fault. We did it, and all sorts of life are suffering because of our choices. I personally love the beach. I love going there. It's one of my favorite places to be. And I honestly think it'd be a real shame if 20 years from now we can't even go in because it's full of garbage and we can potentially die. Hopefully, we can uh, come together and put an end to ocean pollution. Thank you.
All right, Eddie, uh, I like the references you have at the beginning with the visualization of the beaches and why people come here and enjoy those things. And then you've got the negative visualization that goes along with it, imagining the trash all over the place. There's a solid setup of what the goal of your speech is. I think the preview could be a little bit more structured, but we know generally where you're heading. Uh, I, I like the uh, explanation of non-point sources of pollution that you have. Uh, there's good citation of information on uh, those first couple of points that you have. Um, you know, so you're very consistent in doing that. The visualization of the garbage and the uh, patch in the ocean, the cluster, that's uh, pretty solid. Uh, the vivid imagery with the uh, video of the uh, albatross that gets apparently dissected by one of the scientists and the discovery of the um, crap inside of the uh, animal. I thought that that was okay. Uh, what's missing, I think, from that section is a little bit more uh, statistical information to show how widespread the problem is when it comes to affecting marine life. Um, I, I suspect that it's you know, not just a few animals that are affected this way, but I don't know how they, you would find any information to count on it. That's, I think, something that could plug that speech up and give it a little bit more uh, emphasis and a little bit more uh, impact there. Um, the problem is, like I said, divided, uh, you know, divided up clearly. Uh, we can see what your solution is. I, when you get to the solution, I kind of like the idea that you've got this uh, individual approach that can also be used. And I think you need to talk that up a little bit more about how it's how it would make an impact on I things. Yeah. So you so you were trying to adjust a little bit on those things. Oh, that happens sometimes. Um, the you know the your hands are a little bit nervous while you're presenting. You'll see it. You'll notice that you have a tendency to tuck at your sweater, you know, and kind of you know a little uncertain. And then sometimes you're kind of. Uh, you know, with your with your card, you know, I don't know, playing with it or pulling it and and jerking it around a little bit. So you want you want to get better at that. That's where that's where most of your energy is coming out. Your anxiety. Uh, you stand pretty confidently in the last maybe third of the speech. You do seem like you turn a little sideways, and so that felt a little bit awkward. Um, your audience contact I thought was a little stronger at the beginning of the speech. In the middle speech, it tended to be less so. Uh, sometimes you're looking at the notes, and that becomes the distraction. But I thought that in the second half of the speech, it was less about looking at your notes and more like you're just kind of thinking to yourself and you're forgetting to engage in the audience. So. You know, do more of what you were doing in the first half of the speech uh, throughout the presentation. Um, all right, thank you.